Okay, welcome everybody to the eighth episode of the podcast, Mahogany Thoughts. I'm your host, Dr. Terrence Duncan, and with me I have Charlotta Taylor. Charlotta, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Terrence. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well, too. It's good to be back recording again. I know we took a little hiatus. I think the last time we did a podcast was in May, late May, um, and that's when we did the uh, recording with the mental health specialist. So uh, we're going to mix it up this time, and uh, we also have Nicole Nelson. Um, she's um, an attorney and also the executive director for Equity Legal Services. Nicole, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Before we get into the topics, um, shout out to my man, uh, Fat Mac, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Hughes. You got your shirt on. Like I told you, I was going to give a shout out. Um, great shirt. He has all his shirts on Amazon. He's actually a really good DJ. He actually dj for a trivia night for us. So uh, Nick, told you I was going to shout you out. Definitely appreciate the love, bro. Um, definitely going to be doing more events with you in the near future. Um, four months. A lot has happened in the last four months. Um, I know, like myself personally, like I explained on a prior recording, that um, I took myself off of Facebook for a while for more uh, for reflection, um, introspective, and just really trying to map out what I'm going to do today and what I'm going to do for tomorrow. Um, part of that journey actually was with Nicole. Um, I'm actually on a board of directors as the president for Equity Legal Services. Um, and we actually did a food drive out in Centerville, or actually in St. Louis, it was probably what, in August, correct? Yep. So um, that was really, um, it was touching, it was very, uh, you know, heartwarming to be able to give back to the community. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we did the podcast and the reason why Nicole is actually on board <coughs> is um, to be able to show that, you know, the people that you see in the grocery stores or the people that you might see at the mall or, um, just casually passing by, you don't know their story. You know, we're, we're uh, a culture of very highly intelligent and capable individuals. So we want to be able to start, start bringing people on board in the podcast um, that, that looks just like us, but it has a, a story to share. So um, I was able to reach out to my sister, Nicole, and be able to get her to come on board. Um, and so we can be able to start sharing her story, uh, not only on ELS, but actually her background and what led her to become the individual that she is today. Um, I guess, you know, if you could look back in time, you know, Nicole, over the last, you know, if you had a period to really reflect, um, you know, over the last four months, you know, just like things that stood out. I mean, what, what was probably something that you learned the most about these last four months during the summer and the pandemic? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I think, I guess what I learned the most is that, so like while our work uh, maybe at ELS is primarily legal advocacy, um, that the population that we work with, they obviously have needs that go beyond that. Um, so when you talk about the food drive, right, um, just um, always trying to be innovative um, as, you know, the director and thinking about what not only um, the Centerville population needs, but also um, the surrounding community needs. And so when the pandemic hit, and even before that, um, just always trying to make sure um, that as someone that's working alongside the community, um, that we're reaching those needs, um, and that um, I started seeing gaps in what was needed. Um, and so, yeah, I think in those last four months, um, the Urban League has been a spectacular partner uh, to work with and just realized that we could, could and should do more, even though we're, I always say we're a small but mighty organization. Um, and that those were some needs that we could try to help and fill, uh, fill in those gaps. And so definitely food insecurity is something is that a, that's an issue here. I know it's obviously um, nationally, but definitely locally here in these small pockets that we work in. And so that's something that I learned um, that we could step in and try to fill um, and that we are working to. So that's something I um, really saw um, as a need. Um, yeah. And that I learned that we really need to be stepping up in that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Charlotta, what about you? Over the last four months or basically during the summer of the pandemic, uh, what have you learned most about yourself or, you know, activities that you have done um, and, and, and I guess your plan for tomorrow? I think that I've learned just how much creativity that I actually have in me. I think that what it pulled out of me was projects and goals and things that I had lying dormant basically because I just didn't have the time I didn't 
Um, I just didn't pursue different goals. So being at home for me just kind of revived some things that I had lying dormant. They um, just gifts, talents. Uh, I started on a whole international speaking circuit. Uh, it got me in touch with people that I never thought I'd meet around the world. Uh, it just kind of opened my eyes to just the possibilities to just how big this world is and helping me find uh, just a whole new set of opportunities. So um, I was able to to make the most of it. And um, actually, I, I still am. So I, I'm grateful, grateful in, in all things. Absolutely. And, you know, for myself now, you know, these last three, four months, you know, I've been able to get new opportunities. Um, just really just that time just to really, you know, like I said, reflect on yourself. You know, I just think about, I mean, there's a lot that I was able to do over the last 90 to 120 days. But, you know, one thing that I was able to really do was to get back to normal personal communication and interactions, not just through uh, text messages or even through uh, Facebook feeds. But, you know, I really took a lot of time to go visit people um, safely. And, um, you know, or even just picking up the phone and having more conversations or just even if I did text somebody, you know, I would text them generally, you know, like when I know, you know, I have a personal relationship with somebody um, and their first uh, their birthday comes around, I actually send a text message where I might even call them instead of just putting a post on the timeline. I think that, you know, in the midst of everything that's going on right now, I mean, just this little personal interactions really make a big deal. Um, you know, one other thing, too, I you know, was able to write more into the book. Um, and not only be able to add, you know, I think like 60, 70 pages to the book, which is up to 210 now, i am also been able to speak more freely about the book when I'm, you know, working with potential stakeholders. So not only just in the St. Louis area, but in beyond. So to be able to really articulate, you know, what a vision could be or a doctrine um, that could be implemented from a policy, you know, perspective or to help entrepreneurs or even you know, in a conversation with social justice, which we're going to get into later. So that matter of just reflection really made a big difference. Um, a lot of heartache, unfortunately, uh, lost some more people over the last uh, several months, you know, actually uh, lost a family friend yesterday uh, evening. So, uh, you know, shout out to Dory Tuma and her family um, for uh, her passing and also to my New Orleans family for losing my cousin last week or two weeks ago, um, you know, but even during those, those uh, adversities and challenges, you still have to find a way to forge, you know, on, right? So, um, you know, with that in mind, even though I'm speaking with a heavy heart today, um, I think it's still ever important to be able to connect to those that are living. So um, thank you again for taking part of the podcast. And um, Nicole, um, I put your bio up on Facebook and your bio will also be up on a podcast. But uh, just for the viewers, uh, for those who are listening today and for those who are listening tomorrow, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. I am originally from Springfield, Illinois. Um, went to college at an HBCU, um, Alabama State University, um, and then went on to law school at U of I in Champaign. Um, practiced in private practice, although that wasn't my initial goal. I came out um, during the recession um, in 2008, wanted to do public interest law, but as I was interviewing, um, it, was a, it was a freeze um, throughout uh, much of the country, and so ended up in private practice um, and practice with a really remarkable um, uh, practitioner for about four and a half years, um, and then ended up here in the Metro East area. We moved here um, and then ended up in the public interest space um, for the attorney general's office um, and then moved into the nonprofit space. Um, and then I guess during that time in the nonprofit space and then just for a while through public interest and a nonprofit um, for a while, I think I had gr grown um, a bit uh, disenchanted with how the system was looking, particularly for black people. Um, uh, at the AG's office, I was technically considered a prosecutor. I practiced in the Sexually Violent Persons Bureau. Um, saw a lot of uh, Black men um, in civil um, detained indefinitely. Um, I wasn't comfortable with that law, also nor my part in it. Um, and then I practiced on the Missouri side 
um, which I think most of us are aware of how the Missouri system works with the municipalities um, and um, how um, predatory the policing is for low income and black folks. And so I became um, frustrated. I got tired of seeing black people um, in courts and then almost solely um, white staff members overseeing these courts. Um, it was hard, it was frustrating. Um, and then just in the spaces, I was also tired of um, how I perceived um, uh, white people um, interacting with black clients, talking about them. Um, and so that was frustrating for me. So I think collectively I got frustrated mm -hmm. over um, a span of maybe eight or nine years of this. Um, and then that's um, how I ended up starting Equity Legal Services. It was just a collective frustration of the criminal justice system, how it was looking, um, and also just um, kind of the lack of dignity I felt like um, Black and low income individuals and marginalized people were being treated as they came through, not just the criminal justice system, but just accessing the court system. And so then that's how I landed here at Equity Legal Services. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I have some technical difficulties. Real quick, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Um, looks like that we are having some minor technical difficulties because I know that it says live on Facebook, but I know there are individuals saying that they can't see it live. So if mm -hmm. you're not able to see it right away, don't worry about it. It is being recorded as well. So we'll definitely upload the video later. So my apologies. I'll still work on an interim. Um, Charletta, do you have any uh, questions real quick about um, Nicole's background or anything like that before we uh, dive into the questions in uh, social justice? No, no, no questions, no questions. Okay. Um, the reason why we selected uh, Nicole to be on the podcast, uh, something that she had said was, um, you know, some of the work that she was doing on, um, you know, both sides of the river. And, you know, with, right now, criminal justice is has been, but it continues to be in the forefront of conversation, even leading up to the election. Um, social justice is something that rarely gets discussed about. So, you know, for those who may not understand the difference between both of them, social justice involves different tiers, um, different foundations that extend more than just criminal, because really what it comes down to is equity. And, um, you know, without that, you know, equitable system, you know, many of the people that are disenfranchised, they continue to suffer, right? So uh, whether it's through, like Nicole had said, through civil courts, um, whether it's through environmental law, uh, we'll kind of touch up on that briefly, as well as other areas, or even just representation, you know, or even just uh, bias. You know, one of the things randomly discussed is bias, because, you know, like Nicole said, if you have a lot of white attorneys who are working with a lot of cases um, involving the black, you know, community, and they don't have any kind of relatability to it, it's hard to properly defend them, you know? So you're gonna have, and then also um, being in the system for so long, you become jaded after a while. And so, you know, you look at this, you know, you start looking at individualist cases rather than um, individuals. So that kind of unfortunately does affect uh, social justice. So uh, we wanted to kind of bring in a discussion that's a little bit more fresh and something that's a little bit against the grain when you're looking at justice in general. Um, I was able to look online and according to US law, social justice is justice that follows the principle uh, that all individuals and groups are entitled to fair and impartial treatment. Social justice attempts to prevent human rights abu and abuses. Uh, social justice is based on the notions of equality and equal opportunity to society. Um, I also found in a very interesting article about environmental law, and it was actually on the Wilderness Society, wilderness.org. I didn't know that they would, you know, have a, a whole article like that and stuff, but it was really interesting, you know, like this quote that says, like other recent rollbacks, consequences of attacks on NEPA uh, will land disproportionately at the doorstep of Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color. Um, Nicole, when you hear something like that, and I know that this is something that you really are an expert at, what do you... What are your thoughts when you hear statements like that? Are you talking like with regard to the environmental piece or the social justice definition or which? Or just the social justice definition, like in like your relationship on based on the work that you do or are currently doing right now? Um, I mean, I think the definition is always evolving. Um, 
uh, certainly, obviously, it's applicable to the work we do. Um, I don't know if I'm an expert. I think I'm always learning, right? I think, um, for instance, like um, with our work in Centerville, I, um, you know, I consider myself um, privileged to work alongside um, the community that we work with, um, that they allow us to work with them, um, particularly because I know it's not easy to trust um, people that you're working with. Um, uh, we were fortunate that um, that a resident, you know, came to me. So I didn't, you know, it wasn't like outsiders came in and said, hey, let me tell you how to do this or how we can fix this for you, right? Like sometimes happens and communities get taken advantage of. Um, I think, um, I think equity is something that's always evolving, even with our team, right? You're always, we're always trying to figure out how we can make sure that everything that we do is equitable. Um, and I don't, it's not as easy, if you're, I feel like if you're doing it right, that's, it's not always easy. Um, so we're always bouncing each other, things off of each other to make sure we're moving in an equitable fashion, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so to make sure that the residents are at the center of everything we do and that um, they're, they're the decision makers and not us. And I think that's why it's hard to get it right. And that's why a lot of people don't <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Because people want to move so quickly and make the decisions without the community. And so that's why we always say we're community centered and it does slow things down. Um, you know, whether we're applying for a grant or doing this, um, we may not get to apply for a grant sometimes, or it may kick us back our timeline back. Right. Or, or it might make some certain agencies or folks upset, but we say, Hey, we don't, we don't make these decisions. The community does. So we have to go get a hold of them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you're doing things right, that's what equity means. Um, and I think we have to remember just because we, and I say we, my uh, co-partner, Khalila, who's also a black attorney, um, just because we're black females, that doesn't mean that we don't have to be ever mindful of equity and centering this black community that we work with, because we're still not them, right? We're still not the, the people these things are happening to, these environmental uh, um, issues are happening to. Um, and so I think that's why a lot of people get it wrong. Um, and we and we make missteps. And sometimes we have to go back and apologize and say, hey, wait a minute, we probably didn't handle that the best way. So let's go back and regroup. Um, so that's why I say I think it's always evolving and you always, um, I'm always trying to be better. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I feel like I'm always trying to evolve and be a better person in terms of equity. Um, yeah. Hey, Nicole, so, so we're, we're always on this um, quest to be better as mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Twofold question, what would you say to parents and what would you say to, to allies as far as the subject of social justice when it comes to being better, when it comes to uh, parents teaching our children about social justice mm -hmm. and then as far as allies when it comes to being better what would you say to them um are we talking about just parents generally are we talking about <laughs> yeah like if you just had like um just a general conversation about social justice because we have so much coming at us with social media mm -hmm. with, with mm -hmm. kids being on social media and mm -hmm. uh not being able to form their, their own opinions, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of being spoon fed a sure. lot of information. So as parents, we want to be able to teach them how to think critically. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to be aware and to be educated. We don't want them to walk around in fear. Right. But at the same time, we want them to be wise. We want them to be educated we don't want them to walk around with their head in the sand, but we don't mm -hmm. want them to be just like afraid. Every, everybody's out to get me. Everybody's right. out to get me. Right. You know, but we just want them, we want them to be critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective mm -hmm. as parents, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you, what would your advice be to us? I mean, I guess I, um, I don't know. That's a hard one. I can only say like what I do with my kids and my kids are, you know, a little bit younger, uh, but I do try to make them very mindful 
of what's going on. But like you said, it's a balance not to make them scared, right? Um, I when I I can I share stories that I feel like are applicable um, to them. Um, um, we talk about uh, we do talk about what's going on in Centerville. Um, we also talk about um, there was a story not long ago that was going on, and I can't remember uh, what it was. Um, and sometimes we watch um, certain movies, um, and I draw those lessons out with them. Um, and I I don't know about on your end, but I will be surprised in here. My kids just randomly put lessons together, right? Oh. Just like oh that that's because I'm like you, I don't want them to just repeat things because I'm telling them to, right? <laughs> right? And so I will be surprised, like the other day, like my son who is, he'll be, he'll be nine in a couple of weeks, is like, well, and that's why we believe in science because we, and we have to wear our masks, right? Well, I hadn't said <laughs> anything, but he had obviously been like listening to it, right? And so I really tried to let them like glean these lessons on their own, but I'm also very, um, upfront about the things I believe, right? Like I watch yeah. protest videos. I go to protests. I have taken my kids to protests okay. and I explain to them why we go um, okay. and why those things are important to, to me um, and what has happened. And I say them and, you know, like, I, I, and I'm involved with the school, like the school say like, well, we don't believe we should, you know, they don't explain, they explain Thanksgiving in age appropriate ways. Well, I say, well, my, my kids are black. Like, they don't have the luxury of just being explained race in age appropriate ways all the time, right? So I'm also very okay. direct with my kids too. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are the things that I, you know, those are the kind of things that I do. Um, and it, I mean, all kids are different. My other kids, I have a middle child who could really care less about the things I talk about, <laughs> but I feel like um, they also kind of get it um, yeah, in some yeah. way. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a difficult balance, I do feel like, but I get you in the ways that we, I also don't want them to just believe what I believe because that's what I'm saying. I want them to right, grasp right. it and get it because it's something that they've absorbed and understand. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. And then what would you say to allies, people that, uh, there are some people they, they want to be better, they want to, mm -hmm to know more about social justice. They want to get more involved. They want to do something, but mm -hmm. they just typically don't know what to say. They don't know what, what to do. Mm -hmm. they, they just don't know, uh, they don't know enough about social justice. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Um, I have these conversations with people. I often say a couple of things. Um, read, like find articles, look at, um, read, there's plenty of books. If you're friends with um, Black people or there's other white people on your feed that seem to have a better grasp and are sharing articles, read those things. I also uh, say, because there are things, different topics I don't know about, it's always okay to be quiet and read and not feel like you need to comment on everything, right? I mean, just sit back and listen and read and absorb in threads, because there's threads I go into, like I go in and I follow and like a lot of people on Facebook or on Twitter, and I do a lot of learning that way on other subjects, um, and I just absorb it and I, I learn a lot. And so that's why I tell you, like, you don't have to talk. You can just go like and follow all these people, and then you read these threads and you learn a lot. Um, so that's what my advice is to people is to do a lot of learning and reading. And then I've had people ask me like, well, can I, like, can I ask you a question? Yes, you may. Also Google is free. Right. So, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think those are the three things is, uh, reading, uh, like but being curious enough. Like if you really want to be an ally, then I think you will, you'll take the initiative, right? Like, you know how to Google, you'll find books. Um, and you can ask, you, like, you can ask, well, what book should I be reading? Um, and you will go out of your way to diversify who, who, your, who, your, pe who your people are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working at this one place, they had us do this exercise. I don't know if you guys have done it before. Where, like, you have these different color beads and, like, put a black bead if or if you're a doctor is black if your dentist is white if you're however many different well mine are all diversified because 
I mean, I'm, that's just what, that's what we do, I feel like. But a lot of people don't do that, right? And you know, a couple of my friends and I were having this talk. And so I think you also have to go to your way to diversify who's in your network. Because if you don't, then you're just going to get back people who look like you. Right. But yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, I know that you've, uh, like I said, I know that we've done some work with uh, Equity Legal Services for about almost three years, right? Um, would you, and, I, and for me personally, Steph, I think that it's very, um, very noble, you know, your cause for setting up ELS. I was, you know, one of the original people to work with you. And um, we really made a lot of strides over the last three years together. And, and I, I, I personally can't say enough, you know, how proud I am of you. And just a brief, uh, brief uh, background for the audience, you know, um, we have this, uh, we talk about the circle of life and everything, right? And we talk about, you know, just how things come together and stuff. And, you know, my dad um, had hired his, her mother and she, who eventually hired me and she introduced me to um, Nicole. And it's just amazing, you know, almost 20 years later, you know, here we are standing side by side, you know, trying to fight for the injustices for those who don't have a voice. I think that's probably the best way to describe the organization. Um, just the work over the last year has been really empowering and just touching people's lives. And if you want to know um, more about us, please go onto the Facebook page, uh, Equity Legal Services, um, to learn more about, you know, some of the things that we're doing and just for fundraising efforts. Um, we definitely would appreciate your donations as well. Um, Nicole, um, what current projects are is the uh, organization working on right now? And uh, would you, you know, share mind sharing some insight as to you know the current legal fight that we have as much as you legally can? Because um, mm -hmm. I know that some of this is is kind of tied up and stuff. But um, just uh, the story about the Centerville case is really, really, really uh, interesting. You know, that's probably I can't even really put in words how that is and stuff, but some of it has been on the news. If you guys haven't checked out, have checked it out. Um, it's been on the news. It's been featured in the Boston Globe, um, a couple other national uh, publications. So, Nicole, would you do the pleasure of just you know speaking a little bit about that, just to kind of raise awareness to the cause? Sure. Well, we're trying to get national coverage. So, if anybody has any ends, that'd be great. We were in the Boston Review, um, but yeah, if anybody has any ends, that'd be great. We're still trying you know, to. We're trying to get that national Dagon that carrot for that national coverage, but you know, not quite getting there. Um, yeah, but locally we're doing great with the coverage. Uh, yeah, so we, um, our team definitely has our hands full. We, um, we currently have litigation pending in the Southern District of Illinois. Um, we filed that in June. Um, trial is set for next October. We have two plaintiffs um, and a lot of defendants. Uh, which are the city of Centerville, um, Common Fields of Cahokia. Can you give our Can you give our listeners um, like a background of the case? Sure. Um, so, um, since about for this particular for these particular two plaintiffs, um, and just generally, I speaking, I can back up. Uh, so, as far as we can trace it, um, from since the late 1970s. Um, Centerville residents uh, have been dealing with um, sewage backups um, in their homes and in their yards, um, as well as stormwater flooding um, since the late 1970s. Um, and it's in different pockets of Centerville, but throughout Centerville. So initially we thought it was just like one resident. So this is a, a resident I met when I was at a different uh, legal aid office. Um, and then I founded Equity Legal Services. He came over with me. Um, and um, then we just continued as I, when I came over here and founded this organization and um, just more residents called as I, was working with him, residents were like, hey, can you help me? I've had flooding, I've had sewage. And um, Centerville is, um, it's in 2018 and 2019, it was ranked the poorest city um, in the state of Illinois. Um, and it has been ranked as one of the poorest in the country. 
Um, and a lot of our residents do live on very limited incomes, very fixed incomes. And so um, if you butt that up against the fact that they are um, frequently inundated with stormwater flooding um, that takes out their hot water heaters and their furnaces, um, which means then they have to replace these items on fixed incomes as well as buckled flooring because it's constantly inundated with water, mold. Um, a lot of times we've had residents who want to abandon their homes because they can't live in it anymore because of the water um, or they have to move up into like a front room because the back room floor has just been devastated. Um, or if you lift up like a board in the kitchen, the water is just sitting right there. Um, <clears throat> And I, just to clarify, we always say like when we bring new partners on board or we're talking to agencies, like we call this stormwater flooding because it's not from the Mississippi. This, this flooding is from um, a defunct sanitary uh, sewer system as well as a stormwater system. So it's coming from uh, a broken sewer system. Uh, the sewer system has um, been poorly, if at all, maintained in the last several decades. Um, and so it's um, over at or over capacity. And so it overflows. Um, and then you have a stormwater system. Uh, Centerville is a low lying area, which none of us dispute, um, but it's exacerbated by the fact that it, so these, it's on, some of it's on a ditch system, which means um, it, water is supposed to channel through a ditch, stormwater is supposed to channel through a ditch, some ditches, but those ditches haven't been maintained in a long time. And that water is supposed to flow to Harding Ditch. I don't know how many people are familiar with Harding Ditch in St. Clair County, but it runs really quite the length of St. Clair County. And so all these ditches are supposed to run to Harding Ditch, these arteries. Well, <clears throat> this water can't get to Harding Ditch because the ditches haven't been maintained in a long time. And so as a result, the water spills over into the road. So you have the sewage spilling over to the road as well as the storm water. And so then there's, it's, uh, flash flooding within sometimes with on parts of Centerville within 15 to 20 minutes and it can get as high as four to five feet um, and people are losing basement walls they're collapsing um, they're stranded in their homes for hours and then the other parts it might take an hour or two hour to flood them out um, and they're trapped they can't get to work they can't get out and some people can't swim so they're very scared right they're scared they're going to drown in their homes um, and they're also, Centerville is an older population. So a lot of the residents we work with, 60 plus, 60s on the lower end. Um, and so that's that's been the situation and that is the situation in Centerville. Um, what we call the rainy season is usually, I think it's March through August. Um, and then we start again in December. Um, yeah, because of course the snow it melts and, and causes more issues. Um, so we um, brought a couple, uh, Khalil and I brought some partners to the table. Khalil and I got together in uh, October of 2018. I started working on this in March of 2018. Nicole, uh, um, real quick, uh, Khalil, can you just uh, give her a shout out, like who she's affiliated with? Um, Khalil, I was just getting ready to say, Khalil and I met um, when I was working over in Missouri. Um, we were doing some protest work. Um, I don't know if folks remember the Jason Stockley verdict. Uh, when that came down, we worked together. We were just doing, um, helping bail out protesters. Um, and we met, Khalil works at uh, EHOC, the St. Louis Metropolitan Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. It's a nonprofit. Um, and so then we met um, through that protest work and then just stayed in contact um, and got together when I came over to ELS and we decided to meet up for coffee. I told her about the work in Centerville and asked her if she'd be interested and she was like, oh yes, definitely would like to help in any way. And we became immediately became co-partners on the case. Um, and since then we've been working together. Um, and so, yeah, so then um, we filed this first case in June. Um, it's these two plaintiffs and initially we were just asking for fix, fix, the, fix the problem um, because that's what these two plaintiffs wanted. Um, and so we filed that in June. Um, we have quite a few more other people um, and brought some other folks on board along the way over these last couple of years. Earth Justice and NRDC, which are national um, uh, environmental nonprofit firms, as well as Harvard uh, University, which helps us with like project-based items, and then Williams College, which comprises of our 
um, our science team. Um, so yeah, um, we have a really good team. Um, we have a lot of, I mean, aside from that, we have other legal stuff on the table and then just the other um, kind of issues that we, um, trying to think of the word, that we kind of tackle along that that comes with Centerville, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, the, the, the residents want their homes repaired. Um, and so um, there's a fund set up uh, through Hoylton, uh, Youth and Family Services sitting there right now um, that we are working to get built up so that we can start um, getting contractors to help um, repair their homes. And by repair, I'm talking about like we have a resident right now who doesn't, he hasn't had a furnace in like three to four years and it's getting cold out. So we're, they're, they're getting ready to do a fundraiser for that. But then we have, you know, some who don't have hot water heaters, some who have mold, some who have all these different things, right? And these folks have been waiting on city of Centerville, these agencies to do their job, but they're not. And so as a group, we said, okay, how can we come together and figure this out? So we put this fund together and we're, you know, applying to grants to get it funded, but also, you know, fundraising donations. And so these are the different things we do in the background aside from the legal stuff to kind of address the needs, right? So it's this fund, um, also the food insecurity, um, and then also I'm working on <clears throat> Uh, incorporating them as a nonprofit so that um, when this is all said and done, they are an independent organization. They've decided they want to be kind of like a watchdog agency so that this doesn't happen again. Um, and then as well as um, branching out to the surrounding areas. Centerville isn't the only municipality that has these issues. They uh, have the worst by far, um, but other predominantly Black poor municipalities like Washington Park, Cahokia, um, uh, they all have um, similar issues. And so we've been reaching out to folks in Cahokia. We, I receive calls from them pretty frequently asking, can you help me? Um, I'm the only attorney at our organization though, right? Um, so we're just trying to work on expanding our capacity so we can also um, help those folks too. So that's a little bit, that's, that's kind of a broad overview of what we do. Thank you. Are you for getting, any, are you getting any help from any of the, um, like the area churches and businesses in the area or, or um I mean we have sponsors or we haven't approached any churches so I don't want to like say no so no but we haven't to be fair we haven't approached any um we have a really good relationship with the urban league um uh -huh. there's a bottled water so the drinking water is another issue in Centerville okay. um they don't drink the water the sewage overflows, there's a issue with the possibly, yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, there, so there's been a bottled water drive going on at the Urban League since last October. Um, so the Ur Urban League um, helps with that as well as uh, whenever they pick up bottled water, they also do a grocery pickup once a month. Um, so we have another one of the, so we do that once a month. Um, Urban League also just helps us with some other things um, whenever we need it. So the Urban League is a good partner. And then Hoylton is a new partner we developed. When we couldn't find anybody to hold the fund for the residents for about a year, Hoylton stepped in and said, hey, we'll hold the fund and we won't charge you guys any fees. Um, but as far as any churches, we haven't identified any, no. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. tell me, how can, how can our viewers, how can they, how can they help? Um, we are desperately in need of bottled water donation so yeah we have um they can donate bottled water to the urban league they can drop they can drop it off there they can inbox me and i will come get it <laughs> i'm usually the, the go-to um they can donate money to the urban league it's all so the residents have a website it's called flooded and forgotten.com Okay. Um, and on that website, um, if it go, I think they go to um, how, how can I help? It's some variation of that. And there is, uh, it gives you um, the address and how you can donate um, water. But when all else fails, you can also just send me a message on our equity legal services site um, okay. or email me at team um, equity at equity legal services. Um, and I am, I'm always responsive. Um, and also donating to the resident fund um, for those repairs. 
um, the residents, their most immediate goal is trying to get one of the residents this furnace before the, before the winter kicks in. Um, and that's doing, donating to the Hoylton Fund, and that's also on the resident site, the address and where to send those donations to. Is that, yes. is that the flooded and forgotten yep, it's up, it's, yep, it's also there too, uh -huh, flooded and forgotten .com. All that information is on that site. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also yeah. what we'll do too is actually we'll summarize everything and place it on the event page as well. It definitely be shareable because um, we want to be able to leave time for some of our uh, the questions that were coming in. We actually have some individuals who want to ask questions, but, um, you know, I just want to chime in as well and stuff, you know, not only water, but the donations definitely, definitely make a big difference. You know, uh, we are a grassroots startup nonprofit organization. So, um, you know, we, you know, Ms. Nelson literally started from scratch. You know, and um, she was able to get a team together and she's talking about capacity. We are growing at capacity. Uh, we've definitely made strides, um, you know, compared to most other grassroots. But, you know, this is not a, um, it's not an easy undertaking. And, um, you know, you definitely need the resources and, and be able to, to listen to the needs of the community as well. Um, because it's not just Centerville that's experiencing this, this issue. I mean, this is actually, a systemic issue that's been happening across the United States for, for decades. And, um, you know, the social justice element is part of a systemic response because the only way that you can address systemic racism is to have systemic responses. And you have to be able to raise awareness and consciously and consistently continue to speak on such issues that may not be in the mainstream. So definitely appreciate you uh, speaking about that. And for those who are interested on the website, it is uh, equitylegalservices.org. Um, we'll put it on the event page as well. It would also be on the podcast description page as well as my personal website, uh, www.drtduncan.com. Um, before we have a question for the audience, we do have, um, or for the Zoom audience, uh, we did have a Facebook question. Um, what about a celebrity outreach for aid? Um, I'll, I'll speak on that real quick. Um, we are open to take um, whatever that we can to help increase our exposure as long as it's organic um, and as long as it's, uh, you know, it's from the heart. So if there's somebody there who wants, you know, that may listen to this and wants to definitely help and donate the cause and become a stakeholder, we're definitely more than uh, willing to listen um, to whatever resources or time or whatever um, that that person can uh, you know, dedicate. So we definitely appreciate, you know, that type of question. But again, you have to keep in mind that we are a grassroots organization. So just like reaching out to the church, you know, those things take time. And we're ded dedicating our personal time to uh, try to make these things happen. Um, the next question, Nicole, I'll let you add to this one, is uh, what is the city, county doing to fix the root cause of the problem? And you guys, please keep in mind that this is an ongoing um, issue. So, you know, we, you know, there's some things that we can be at liberty to speak on and there's some, some liberties we're just gonna have to nod our head in agreement with the smile, so. Oh, it's fine, I don't, I mean, they, it's all good. Okay, um, I don't know what, like, like I said, I don't know. Oh, no, I think we all have a mutual dislike for each other. Um, let's see, <laughs> what is the, what are the county, city, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> This, let me make sure I'm fair in this answer here. Let's see. The city of Centerville, um, well, they've been quoted in the paper saying they don't have any money. So that's what the, 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 the party line is. They don't have any money um, to fix it. Um, I think there is a general wonder as to what, what, what are they doing with the money? Um, they have dug some ditches um, last summer, winter. There were some ditches dug alongside the road um, to try to alleviate some water. There's a levee that runs behind some houses um, in Centerville and um, the city of Centerville dug some ditches, some small ditches. And I believe the idea was that water would then run through these small ditches to alleviate the water that was falling over onto the side to the roads. 
Um, those ditches have filled back in now because they weren't maintained. So this was small ditches alongside the deeper ditches. I think you can get my sentiment <laughs> where I'm with this. Um, and now those ditches have grown back over. Um, and then they also dug some deeper culverts on certain sides. Um, so I will say this to say that, and we have said this as a team, and I've made this clear um, to uh, city and the representatives, it is, uh, these efforts are reflective of their efforts or lack thereof over the decades. Um, they're um, inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, it's an infrastructure problem. And um, I think that is known, it's an infrastructure problem. And so um, they're right, they're Band-Aid efforts. I believe that's almost a direct quote from the Mayor Jackson. These are Band-Aid efforts and they don't fix the problem. Um, and they still leave the residents vulnerable to flooding. So I can't say they haven't done anything, but they haven't done things that are substantive to fix the problems that are there. And these things that they have done have only happened following us mobilizing. So as far as the county, I'm not sure what St. Clair County is doing. We do uh, uh, the uh, years of the state and our uh, state federal. Um, did you mention about uh, Senator Duckworth? I'm sorry, uh, Senator Duckworth. No, but I mean they've been great allies. We reached out. Uh, uh, they reached out to us actually through one of the scientists on the team. I think we've been working with them. It might be almost a year now. Um, they've been great allies. They have. Uh, attend the resident meetings, the residents um, have a committee. Their committee is called Centerville Citizens for Change. They meet twice a month, two Tuesdays a month. Um, and um, Senator Duckworth's office, uh, one of the representatives attends those meetings usually. Um, prior to it being uh, over Zoom, they would come when we met, met at the church before prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, they, um, advocate for the changes that are needed um, and are trying to help us with some resources needed to figure out what pumps uh, on an urgent immediate basis need to be replaced to get the residents some relief. So yeah, they've been great um, and even trying to rally some of the local officials together to get some accountability going. So yeah, they've been nothing but in, in came and visited, um, as some folks may know, in July visited with some of the residents, um, Senator Duckworth herself, um, and spoke with them in a small um, private setting um, to discuss the issues and hear them out. Yeah, they've been great. You know, I just want to ask you before we go to the next question, um, just thinking about the efforts that you did, Nicole, and the organization. Um, you know, a lot of these problems are not going to be solved overnight. You know, um, like I said, Centerville is, is one of many stories. And I, you know, I have family near Starkville who went through a similar situation where they were basically dumping toxins and you know, um, you know, mm -hmm. you guys don't know the history of it. You know, a lot of the major uh, U.S. interstate system was designed to cut through black communities uh, to create environmental waste, sewage, and zoning laws were re, uh, reconfigured to uh, the depressed property value. So one thing I did want to address because I have family from New Orleans and it's almost kind of reminds me of the Katrina situation, why people didn't leave and stuff. And people, you know, I've actually had some people ask me, well, why haven't the people from Centerville left their home and sold right. them like that? You know, right. how about you put your money into something that you uh, had a lot of pride, you worked hard as hell to, to obtain, or has been in a family for, for decades, for generations, and um, because the ineptitude of a government and just, you know, business as usual, you know, your, your, your house values are, are next to nothing, so. That's right. And so yeah, and trying to sell your home, you know. Yeah, and they can't, yeah, and a lot of the residents can't afford to move, like we remember that they're on fixed incomes. Um, when a lot of the residents moved there, um, this was an affordable place to live that they could, they were working, you know, um, you talk about one of our residents, um, he worked, you know, two or three jobs back, you know, several decades ago and bought this home and then paid for it. And almost all of our residents, almost all of them, I can't think of them, maybe one or two, their homes are paid off. So they don't have mortgages, um, right? And so at these ages, 
you know, mid 60s, 70s, some of our residents are 80s, a couple are 90s, where are they going to move that they can afford to take a mortgage on, you know, then too, all of the money that they put in to even maintaining it at this point because of the constant flooding, putting in new floors over and over again, like you said, leave and go where? I mean, we also forget um, that one of the last vestiges of, you know, wealth for generational wealth for Black people is home ownership. Um, and to give that up and give that up at these ages is, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you can't ask, you can't ask that. And they don't want to move. They don't want to leave. Right. And I wanted to add that human side to it and stuff, because a lot of times we look at these cases, these newspaper articles and stories, and we just think it's a simple solution. Right. And you have to understand for those who are listening to the audience, for those who may not be in the St. Louis, East St. Louis area, or too familiar with Centerville in general, you know, those people that are, are affected, these people actually had careers. You know, they actually, you know, they, they paid the taxes, you know, they worked, they, you know, they, they took care of their property and invested their ability. And like I said, now they're spending, you know, the little income that they have uh, remaining because, they, you know, they're old enough, you know, they can't work right now or anything like that. For most of them, you know, they have to take care of, you know, whatever. They're spending their own money that they have left, every penny that, you know, to basically maintain their home the best way that they can. So I just wanted to provide a very personal element. And ELS is bigger than just the Centerville case. I mean, there's other projects in the work, but um, this is definitely something, you know, um, I'll tell you that just to see the smiles on her face for some of the work that we have been able to accomplish is really, really powerful. Um, we do have a question from Donna. Um, she's on the Zoom call as well. Um, Donna, I think, mm, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Hello. Um, well, I've loved hearing about the work that ELS is doing. Um, I do have a question, and it's not, I know you might not be able to answer it specific to uh, Centerville, but, you know, these disenfranchised communities throughout the nation, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about from um, a historical perspective, right? And when I say disenfranchised, I'm talking about the, the, the environmental injustices that have been done to them. Um, from a historical perspective, why do we see communities um, that have had these social injustices done, that have ended up in these areas that haven't been cared for, like the ditches haven't been taken care of, or we have a, uh, in Lowndes County, Alabama, there's another community that has problems with flooding. Like from a historical perspective, what happened? <laughs> I can go ahead. Um, I want to go ahead and just give a quick rebuttal or a quick response to that. Um, it's systemic. I mean, it's, you know, you start off with a larger word, systemic, and then you start breaking down to different areas. And that's what the podcast is not only about, but also the Mahogany Legacy Project, which will come out a little later. This is not a plug, but this is actually facts. You know, this is evidence-based research that in a lot of these communities, it all starts off with the, like, we're going to talk about next weekend is voting. Um, you know, you have uh, people in place that has the ability and authority to change things in the whim. And so if you've been disenfranchised to vote and if you have voter suppression, that's one level of it, right? Um, because those ones who are actually in office, they can write legislation to continue to disenfranchise. If you have people who have um, um, racial or stereotypical views towards a disenfranchised or indigenous people, that are zoning commissioners. They can change zoning laws and stuff for people to dump environmental waste into the communities. If I recall correctly, the city of East St. Louis actually had their zoning laws become changed slowly over time so they can dump their waste and everything like that in the Brooklyn Madison area. Um, you know, and as affects their quality of life. And then just, you know, you look at it from a banking standpoint, you know, look how many, you know, from redlining, how many banks are not providing individuals the opportunity to get equity out to to make home improvements in their lands. I mean, for most of us at this day and age, you know, if we have a home, we can probably go to a, our bank or a, a lender to get home equity to fix our home up and stuff. But like Nicole was saying, if your home values are depressed to the point that you don't have any, uh, your, your assets are minimal, you know, you're pretty much stuck in this ongoing box. And then when you start having all these other other, you know, systemic issues that's circling around this, uh, this larger issue, then you wound up having the deterioration and having situations, you know, like the one in Alabama, we talk about, or in Starkville, or in Centerville, 
or even a corner of Philadelphia, neighborhoods of Philadelphia. So, um, you know, we're starting to be woken up to it in a different level now, but that's really what the history has been about. You know, since the Jim Crow era, there has been nothing but um, decades of, you know, just loopholes that are lost to exploit to continue to oppress us in a variety of ways outside of ways that you see on a regular basis. Nicole? No, you, you explained it very well. Charlotte? I think you, I think you pretty much summed it up. Okay. Um, Phyllis, do you have any questions? We have a couple of guests on our Zoom call. <laughs> no. no. Thanks, Karen. No. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, a little laughter. It was even kind of heavy, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so, <laughs> Sunny, do you have any questions? Okay, she probably does. I'm going to check Facebook one more time to see if you have any other questions from the audience. Um, oh, no help from FEMA. We have a question is, is, is there no help from FEMA? Oh, that's a good yeah. question. So, because um, this is thrown around a lot in our group. Um, so technically because, um, so two sides of this, while IDNR, which is Illinois Department of Natural Resources considers uh, Centerville as part of a floodplain, FEMA's maps don't consider Centerville as part of a floodplain. So when, and also because these flooding situations aren't really part of like, they're considered inland flooding and not you know, there's structural flooding. Uh, they don't they don't qualify for FEMA assistance at this time. Um, they they qualified one time, and that was the '93 flood, which I think everybody remembers the '93 floods in Illinois when they. But otherwise, they don't qualify for FEMA flooding. And also, um, most of the residents um, do not have flood insurance. One, because it's cost prohibitive for them, um, and two, a lot of them. Um, don't really have homeowners insurance anymore because they used to have it, but then they submitted so many claims because of the flood uh, and issues that happened that they couldn't afford their home insurance anymore because um, uh, the cost went up so much that uh, many of them don't even have homeowners insurance anymore. So there's, uh, like I said, a lot of um, issues that go along with the things that are going on in Centerville. Um, Charlotte, any questions or, you know, remarks before we um, finish this uh, session? I'd just like to say that I, I'm really glad that you brought out the point as to why people don't just leave. I think that there are a lot of people that ask that question, why, why don't people just leave? And mm -hmm. I think that for a lot of people that are so far removed from poverty, mm -hmm. that is the question. And um, there are a lot of people that ask the question, maybe not out loud, but mm -hmm. silently, it's just like, why don't they just leave? Why, why would you stay in a house where there's raw sewage or why, why would you, why wouldn't you just pick up and leave? I don't understand mm -hmm. that. But there are people in the world who cannot afford to leave. There are some people in the world that are older and that is their, that is the only thing that they have. They've worked their whole lives and to come to a point where th this is what your life is and at least you have this. And so if you finally get to the place where you meet someone like Nicole and an organization that is, is trying to help you and they give you some hope that's that's a gleam of of a hope to where it's like okay well maybe I can stay in my home and there, there's a sense of pride that comes with that and and it's no different from me you or anyone else who takes pride in what we have and what we want for our children and and when we take care of our yard when we take care of our home so I just hope that people that are listening can take it 
upon themselves to say, okay, instead of asking why wouldn't people just leave, maybe ask yourself, what can I do to help these people? What can I do? Can I donate water? Can I write a check? Can I donate a furnace? If I have that type of resource, what can I do to help these people stay in their home? What can I do to make them more comfortable in their home? That, that's what I like to say. You know, just to add that and stuff, I'm trying to, it's been on my mind and I can't remember what the device is. Uh, Nicole, you probably can help me out on this one. You know, one of the residents I remember uh, definitely prior to Corona had mentioned something about a water extractor. You know, um, I mean, like Nicole has said, you know, when they get a lot of rain, you just, you know, that water can, you just don't know how much water is going to either come in the home or come near the property or inside the property. And, you know, I mean, we take a lot of things for granted and stuff, you know, like we get some rain, you know, it's like always good for the grass, but, you know, you have to remember for those people who are struggling and suffering down there, you know, a lot of rain for them is not a good thing. It's not good for their grass. It's not good for the yard or whatever the case may be. So, you know, if you are an interested stakeholder, it um, doesn't matter if you're black or white, and if you have access to resources to help, you know, provide for uh, a water extractor. I, I really don't know the name. Of the oh, I know what you're talking about. Those were the, um, that was pre-pandemic. It's, um, we were, had um, industrial size water pumps. Pumps, yeah, water pumps. Were so. donated, um, but then, um, this project is extremely complicated. It was, they were donated, uh, the residents wanted them, um, and they were donated by one of our funders. Um, and then COVID, COVID hit. And then, cause we had a, a rental program free. It was just the residents could go get them from the urban league, check them out and have these, that could push the water out away from their home. So it wouldn't inundate them. But then COVID hit and you know, this water also has waste in it. And so then we realized COVID, you could contract COVID possibly through wastewater. Oh, so we oh. didn't, yes. So we didn't want to facilitate that risk through that. And so we did so we did not start the rental program. We returned the pumps, put the money in their fund. And then instead with this fund, we will um, find a vendor, which the residents will be responsible for through a subcommittee, uh, finding a vendor. So if there's a vendor out there um, who um, wants to work with us, um, we will be um, working with a vendor um, and pay them through this fund to pump water out because um, the idea is that a vendor, a person who does this will have the correct protective gear um, to pump water from these homes. So that way we will pay for a, a certain number of calls through this fund and this person can go out and pump water from the homes instead of having the residents take on that risk. So yes, that's what the fund is also used for. You know, just resources, you know, basically resources, you know, I mean, just something like that where the call is asking for a potential vendor, you know, um, you know, whether it be donating water bottles or just donating, um, you know, your money or even donating your time. I mean, you know, we do plan in 21 to have some events that's going to be very community service oriented. Uh, we did work with Urban League to do a food drive in Brooklyn um, in August as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure we'll have some other things as well as future fundraisers. So, um, you know, please be on the lookout. Please go on the Equity Legal Services uh, Facebook page. Um, I, I share as often as I can on there. Um, you know, so especially like the links and stuff, and I actually will put the link on my, my personal page as well and my professional page. Um, so definitely please, you know, think about, you know, though, you know, while you're sitting there in your home and stuff, you just think about those who are, you know, less fortunate than us and stuff. And just remember, I mean, this fight that we have for equality, it takes all of us, you know. So, I mean, it doesn't matter if you got your job or you got your business you know, or, you know, you're just sitting here trying to figure out how to get your utilities to be paid for the next month. You know, we're all into this together. You know, that has to be the mindset that we have. And that's the purpose of this podcast is to be able to, again, bring individuals and stuff that just look like regular folks that you see in the store or just passing through. And we all have a story to, sh to share and it's time for our voices to be heard, controlled by ourselves, you know, instead of, um, you know, uh, having these little small little snippets of stories. Uh, provided on the news or in a newspaper article. So, you know, definitely, definitely thank you again for coming on HBCU grad, um, you know, for young black women, you know, just sitting here saying, hey, you know, I, I want to be an attorney. You know, this is, this is what a face with an attorney looks like, you know, to come in, go to HBCU, become an attorney, to start a nonprofit, to do great work in the community, 
I mean, there's more stories like that that can be created, you know, um, you know, regardless of how you how young you are or how old you are. So um, thank you again, Nicole, Charletta, and everybody for listening. Um, next weekend, we're going to talk about voting. We're going to talk about voter suppression. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, voter beyond a general election, being involved. You know, let's stop being involved the last three months of caring about what's going <laughs> on. I'm going to put, you know what, I'm going to say this before I go. Look, there's really never going to be one Black leader right now. You know, so, but what we can have is a variety of different leaders with different ideas as long as we move the conversation forward, you know, um, and as long as it's not ignorant on top of it, too, because the stuff that 50 said, I, I, I don't know, man. But um, by the end of the right, but people still going to watch college. But by the end of the day, <laughs> you know, but by the end of the day and stuff, you know, um, you know, you may not agree with the opinions that's been shared today. Um, you may not agree with our views and stuff, but at least have a conversation. This podcast is a, a conversation. I'm more than welcome to have anybody on this podcast, um, you know, from a serious side to the enlightened side. I just got a text from DJ Fat Mac, got the shirt on. We're going to have a podcast about his love for music. You know, we're going to, you know, bring that energy as well and stuff and just show, you know, we're a beautiful culture. Let's go ahead and, and celebrate it and, and talk about the issues in a, in a very fair, balanced, and ethical way. So thank you again, everybody. For Thank you uh, both. You guys yes. are great. Thank you so much for having me. And that will conclude our podcast. And uh, thank Nicole. you for listening. Thank you. So nice meeting you and talking nice to you. Absolutely. And, uh, and like I said, the actual video, I do apologize for the Facebook technical, technical difficulties. Uh, I don't know what happened, but apparently eventually did get on. But I'll actually upload the, the full video um, later on uh, today. So thank you again, everybody. God bless, and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.